Yeah, so in my laboratory, we are mainly interested in how hematopoietic stem cells are born during development of the vertebrate embryo. And for the most part, we have been working to leverage the unique strengths that the zebrafish embryo presents to get at this question in ways that are complementary to those that are taken in the mouse or human pluripotent stem cell systems. And so today, I will tell you about um, four different roles that the somite is actually playing in the instruction of hematopoietic stem cell fate. All of these things have come as a surprise to us, and so the embryo has taught us that we need to look earlier and earlier during embryogenesis to really understand that time window when HSCs are being um, genetically encoded. And so we've already heard about at this meeting um, the power of hematopoietic stem cells. Um, this um, hematopoietic tree really has served as a paradigm for how most tissue-specific stem cell systems work um, in the um, animal with exceptionally rare HSEs at one end of the tree that give rise to these transit amplifying progenitor cells that in the end produce um, multiple lineages of adult blood cells for our entire life. And so um, these cells are the first stem cells that have been used in the clinic. They've been used in the clinic for decades now and underlie the efficacy of bone marrow transplantation. And while um, this um, technique has saved thousands of lives over those years, it is still um, fraught with difficulties in that it is um, very difficult to find genetic matches for many patients in need of a bone marrow transplant. And so um, work in the past um, decade or so has been, has been focusing on trying to harness this amazing discovery of Shinya Yamanaka and colleagues who have um, learned how to take a somatic cell from any one of us, put in a handful of factors into that cell and generate a pluripotent stem cell. And so this has now become very straightforward. And so uh, a variety of laboratories around the world can do this um, from any patient in need to generate um, patient-specific iPS cells. And so the idea is we could then instruct those pluripotent cells, which have the ability to give rise to any tissue in the body, into um, tissue-specific stem cell subsets, including HSCs for patient-specific therapy. And so the idea, as shown here in this slide, is we would generate iPS cells from a patient. Um, we could then instruct those to generate hematopoietic stem cells, could correct any genetic deficiencies if necessary, and then put those back into that person for a patient-specific hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And so this is fantastic on paper, but in practice, it has not been possible to generate bona fide HSCs from iPS cells, despite really good labs working on this for um, 30 to 40 years now. And so some of the reasons for this are illustrated in this slide, um, where a developmental hematopoiesis is actually a lot more complicated than you might expect. And so there are four different waves of hematopoiesis during development of the vertebrate embryo. This is, I think, conserved across all vertebrate animals studied. Um, there are the so-called primitive waves, which give rise to relatively simple subsets of blood cells, including myeloid cells, erythroid cells, and then there's a transient progenitor, which gives rise to a variety of cell types. But the bottom line is that all of these cells are transient. They do not have self-renewal potential, and it's not until this fourth and final wave of hematopoiesis um, that hematopoietic stem cells are genetically encoded, and these are the only cells that are multipotent and able to give rise to the suite of um, effector uh, immune cells for the life of the animal. And so the main work in my laboratory is trying to understand why is this process different? Because um, you know, with embryonic stem cells and iPS cells, it's relatively easy to generate these early hematopoietic cell types. But as I mentioned, it's been almost impossible to date to generate these HSCs, or what you, which is what you need for patient-specific uh, transplant therapies. And so to really understand what makes this population unique, we first needed to understand exactly when and where HSCs were born um, during zebrafish development. And so um, at the time I started my laboratory, this was actually a controversial issue. There was several different competing models as to where HSCs were born. We reasoned because we were working in this beautiful system, which is completely translucent, we should be able to simply watch uh, with the correct tools 
and learn where each of these come from. And so in this confocal time-lapse image, um, I will um, focus on this area here in the trunk, uh, which is where um, work from many laboratories had suggested HSCs um, initially um, show up. Um, what Julian Bertrand did um, when he was a fellow in the laboratory is he generated a double transgenic animal where all the vasculature was marked by this Flick1 um, M. cherry transgene and the developing hematopoietic stem cells by this green um, CMIB GFP driver here. What you're looking at here is the aorta on the top. Just underneath that is the cardinal vein. And if you watch these two arrowheads as this movie progresses, you will see that these cells, which initially start off looking like typical flattened endothelial cell morphology, these cells round up. Um, they enter um, circulation and leave that site um, in the aortic floor. Is another cell undergoing the so-called endothelial to hematopoietic transition. And so we learned from these events and from also doing lineage tracing in which we use this same Flick1 driver to express a Cree recombinase. When we did these experiments, we could show that effectively all of the adult hematopoietic cells are derived from this transient developmental event, which takes place over about two days of development in the zebrafish embryo. And so knowing that um, hematopoietic stem cells derive from this particular region of the embryo, and this is not um, true only in the zebrafish, this appears to be highly conserved in all vertebrate animals looked at, including us, is that um, what I just showed you is that HSCs come from this endothelial to hematopoietic transition um, from the floor of the dorsal aorta. They enter circulation and go on to seed the subsequent hematopoietic sites. What we have been focusing on is where do these hemogenic endothelial cells come from? With the main question being, when uh, are hematopoietic stem cells fated? In other words, when do these cells know that they are going to be different than their neighboring arterial endothelial cells which do not have this potential? And so if we go back to the beginning, um, early lineage tracing studies um, showed us that um, a population of ventral mesoderm in the late blastula goes on to give rise to all of the axial blood vessels as well as the hematopoietic um, lineages. Um, during gastrulation, um, these cells um, migrate into these concentric stripes of what's called lateral plate mesoderm shown here. And if you look through um, a virtual cross-section of this, um, what is known is that signals produced from the midline of these animals are secreted and recruit these um, endothelial precursors to the embryonic midline. First are the arterial cells in red, followed by the cells that go on to contribute to the vein in purple. Um, these cells coalesce at the embryonic midline to form this vascular cord from which the aorta and the vein parse out. And then it's only from the aortic floor that these HSCs emerge. And so what we've learned over the past several years is that this time point in development as these cells are crawling from these lateral positions to the midline are incredibly key in um, the genetic specification of this lineage. And so what um, we've learned is that these cells here in red, which are the shared vascular precursors of both the dorsal aorta and of HSCs, need to make intimate contact with the somite, which are these blocks of tissues shown here, in order to get signals needed to become HSCs. And so um, particularly what this phase looks like, I think is really nicely illustrated in this confocal time-lapse illustrated, um, that were generated by Isao Kobayashi when he was a fellow in the lab. Um, what you're going to be looking at here, we're looking down on top of a developing embryo um, that has two different transgenes. One, it's a FLY1 GFP transgene, which includes um, all the vascular precursors and the HSC precursors. Um, the other is a PHLW1M cherry transgene, which marks these blocks of Semitic tissue in red. And so as you watch this confocal time lapse, so the head of the animal is to the left and the tail is to the right, you'll see that the stripes of lateral plate mesoderm actually um, zipper across the somite, underneath the somite, to form um, these axial blood vessels here, which go on. They're forming now the aorta and the vein and these structures also that go on to become the vasculature and the head on the left of these animals. And it's really during this time window between 10 and 20 hours post-fertilization that these cells are becoming fated to the HSC lineage.
And so I told you that I was going to tell you um, different stories about how the somite regulates um, HSC emergence. Um, so I need to tell you a little bit about the somite. And so um, if you look at this cartoon, which is a demonstration of a, um, a virtual section, uh, like a, a cross section through developing animal, the somites are these bilateral blocks of tissue which flank the neural tissues. And the somites are um, complex structures are highly regionalized and each one of these regions gives rise to a variety of different um, tissue types, give rise to bone, to uh, muscle and to skin. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I will focus on two different parts of the somite. First is the sclerotome, which is this ventral domain shown here in green. And at the end, I'll tell you about um, an interesting um, role for the dermomyotome in generating this interesting population of endothelial cells, which appear to be very key uh, niche elements um, for HSCs as they mature. And so our initial foray into the somite um, started when Wilson Clements was a fellow in the laboratory. And um, he became interested in the role of wind signaling in um, hematopoietic stem cell emergence. And the wind he focused on was a wind called wind 16. And he focused on this one because um, he noticed that it was expressed in this region of the cell mite called the sclerotome, which again is this ventral domain. It's shown here by these hatched lines. And this um, region is directly adjacent to where these migrating posterior lateral mesoderm cells um, um, come from. And so um, the bottom line is that when Wilson knocked out WIN16 function, we lost formation of the sclerotome, which in turn led to a complete loss of hematopoietic stem cells. So Wilson went on to show that what WIN16 is doing is activating the expression of two different notch ligands, delta C and delta D, that together were necessary to specify um, the sclerotome. And so what Wilson showed is that this pathway was critical for HSC specification. If you knock out any one of these components, there are essentially no hematopoietic stem cells generated. And so this told us the surprising and early role for the somite and the instruction of HSC fate, but we were left wondering how um, the sclerotome was actually signaling to these cells. So it wasn't until Isao Kobayashi joined the laboratory that we figured this out. And so Isao came to the lab with an interest in adhesion in molecules, and in particular, um, junctional adhesion molecules, or these so-called jam molecules. And so what Isao showed is that um, these precursors of hematopoietic stem cells express a jam called JAM1A. Um, what he also showed is that they then interact with the ventral face of the somite with another jam, JAM2A. And you need this tight interaction between these cells to transduce a notch signal. And so notch signaling requires cell-to-cell -cell contact. And what Esau showed is that this um, connection is needed between these two cell types in order for um, delta D to be presented by the somite to the NOTCH1B receptor on the migrating precursors of HSCs. And the bottom line is if you disrupt any one of these four components, um, you do not transduce the requisite NOTCH signal. And although the HSCs migrate to the right place, they all, the HSC precursors, we can find them in the floor of the aorta, but without any one of these components, without this sort of requisite NOTCH signal, they all die in situ by program cell death. And so what these experiments told us is that um, the somite is required to interact with HSC precursors to transduce this very strong level of notch signaling, which they need um, to undergo their maturation to HSCs. And so, so far, I've told you about two different roles of the somite very quickly in that WIN16 regulates expression of two notch ligands to form the sclerotome, and that that sclerotome is then needed in turn to present one of those ligands, delta D, to the migrating precursors of HSCs. And so we knew that one of the um, immediate events of this notch signal is the transcriptional upregulation of a transcription factor called GATA2B. Here you can see the first expression of GATA2B as these cells are migrating uh, towards the embryonic midline early. You see at later time points, this becomes an exquisitely specific marker for hemogenic endothelium. All of these cells here are uh, marking the precursors of HSCs. And because of this beautiful specificity, we generated a transgenic line that expresses the transcriptional um, transactivator, GAL4, under the GATA2B sequences. And what we can see is that we can see the emergence 
of these HSEs here shown on the right, and we can actually follow with movies um, the um, conversion of hemogenic endothelium to these nascent HSCs, which go on to seed subsequent hematopoietic sites, including the thymus to generate T cells, and the pronephros, which in teleos goes on to become the adult hematopoietic organ. And so with this beautifully specific tool, we return to this initial question, is what is Wnt signaling doing in um, the emergence of hematopoietic stem cells? And so I told you about Wnt16. Um, what I didn't tell you was that is a non-canonical Wnt ligand, which means exactly how it is received and how that signal is transduced um, is difficult to study. This is something that um, Wilson is continuing to look at in his own group at St. Jude. Um, we wanted to know what the role of canonical Wnt signaling was, which involves um, beta-catenin. And so beta-catenin is um, activated upon binding of canonical Wnt ligands, where it then can then enter the nucleus and interact with uh, a TCF transcription factor to activate Wnt target genes. And so in order to block canonical Wnt signaling, we um, utilized a um, transgenic line which um, has the GAL4 binding site, UAS, upstream of a dominant negative TCF. And so with this dominant negative um, TCF molecule is induced, it is a very uh, efficient blockade of canonical wind signaling. And so the net effect of that, as you can see here, and so in wild type control animals, we can see um, nascent um, hematopoietic stem cells arising here by their expression of C-MIB and in situ hybridization. Um, in um, GATA2B dominant negative TCF animals, we see a really a profound drop in HSC number. That's quantified here on the right, where we see typically about 30 HSCs um, arising in a normal animal. But following blockade of wind signaling, we see that number halved to about um, half that number, about 15 cells. And so um, we wanted to know which of the 26 Wnt ligands were mediating this effect. And so to make a long story short, we looked at the expression of all of those different ligands and focused on one called the Wnt9A. This was interesting to us because it was expressed um, in the developing somites, which you can see here on the right, and was expressed um, at the right time. And so what Stephanie had shown using other tools is that if we blocked wind signaling between 10, to 10 and 20 hours post-fertilization, we saw this twofold decrease in HSC numbers. If she did that blockade after 20 hours, we saw no effect on HSCs. And so this is a very early requirement. And so this expression pattern of went 9 a uh, matched that perfectly. And so we went on to show in this paper and cell reports a, a lot that we did in close collaboration with um, Carl Willick's group. And so both Stephanie and Jenna, were shared uh, postdoc and student respectively in both of our groups. Um, we showed that Wnt9A is expressed by the developing cell mite within this early developmental window that is received as these HSC precursors, again, migrate across the cell mite. If they receive this signal, they are set up to proliferate nicely. If they don't, we see this proliferative block. And this is really interesting because we've never seen this sort of phenotype before in any of our genetic perturbations. Uh, previously, all of our perturbations have led to specification defects, so the initial number is different. In this case, the initial number of HSCs is totally normal compared to wild-type um, cells, but what we see is then a subsequent um, proliferation arrest, and that's really nicely illustrated in this slide. And so Stephanie showed that beginning at about 30 hours post-fertilization, when the numbers of stem cells between these animals is the same, um, control stem cells begin to proliferate after this time, whereas in animals that are have the Wnt signaling um, blocked, these animals are effectively flatlined, where we do not see um, proliferation from these stem cells. And this is interesting because even when we use a morpholino to knock down Wnt9A function, um, this proliferation block appears to be sustained into late larval stages, and we think even into adulthood. And when we look in these um, morphunter mutant animals in adulthood, we see defects in the um, kidney marrow, which are similar to what we see in human patients with myeloproliferative disorders. And so this is something that Stephanie is continuing to look at in her laboratory in Michigan. And so we, um, I told you that when we have loss of Wnt9A function, we see a twofold drop in HSC number. 
Um, this is true with a variety of different reagents. There's two different morpholinos that lead to two, two similar phenotypes. Interestingly, when we knock down the function of WENT9B, which is a closely related paralog, um, we see no significant defects in HSC number. And so the surprise came in these studies when we started doing rescue experiments. And so to prove this morpholino was specific, we rescued um, its um, loss of function by putting a WENT9A cDNA back into the system. When we do that, we can in fact rescue HSC's numbers to being uh, normal. The surprise came when we used other canonical WENT ligands. Um, the effect here was very different. We could not rescue loss of HSCs when we put back other canonical WENT ligands like WENT9B, WENT3A. We also used WENT8. And um, the bottom line is um, that no other canonical WENT ligand could rescue this loss of WENT9A. And this was very surprising to us because the dogma in the wind field is that WENTs are WENTs. Um, any canonical WENT can rescue the loss of another canonical WENT as long as it's provided in the right sort of time and place. And so these results were very different and told us that in this scenario, it appeared that the requirement for WENT9A was specific. And so um, Stephanie then wanted to figure out how the specificity was mediated. And so we identified um, the receptor for WENT9A as being um, frizzled 9B. And then Stephanie set out to do um, a series of really heroic experiments where she did structure function experiments by doing domain swaps between the correct frizzled, which is frizzled 9B, which is shown in this um, figure in green, and an irrelevant frizzled, frizzled 8A, which has zero um, role in hematopoietic stem cell specification. And so what Stephanie did is she added recombinant um, zebrafish went 9 a to human went reporter cells, which had recombinant versions of the zebrafish receptors. And so when we give um, zebrafish went 9 a to the proper frizzled, we get a strong went signaling readout shown here. When we add went 9 a to the wrong frizzled, frizzled 8, we see effectively no went signaling. Um, we were surprised to learn, we assumed specificity would be mediated by this extra cellular region, which is the login binding domain for WET9A. Um, we did not see that. What Stephanie saw was very different. When she um, swapped the correct domain, so this cytoplasmic tail of frizzled 9B onto the frizzled 8A substrate, she could rescue some signaling. Um, there was an adjacent cytoplasmic loop where she saw a very similar thing. And then I think what was initially very shocking to us is when she put both of these domains from frizzled 9B onto this irrelevant frizzled receptor, she could fully restore wind signaling. And so these experiments taught us a couple of things. First, it taught us that yes, wind signaling is, um, is um, promiscuous. So the, the right wind can bind to the wrong frizzled, but what's mediating the specificity in this scenario were these cytoplasmic domains. And there was zero precedence for this in the literature. So it left us confused as to how this might be working. And so we thought about it and reasoned um, that the following model must be at play. And so the model is when went 9A is provided um, to these cells, it binds to frizzled 9B. It recruits the cofactors like LRP, axon, and disheveled, which are needed for a functional um, went signaling complex, and Stephanie reasoned that there must be a co-receptor that could somehow bridge the reception of went 9 a to the cytoplasmic regions that she showed were critical in these domain swapping experiments. Um, she nicknamed this awesome for a went signaling molecule since we had no idea what this co-receptor might be. And so we teamed up with David Gonzalez's group here at UCSD, who is really a master at um, using these APEX assays as well as mass spec. And so what Stephanie did is she tethered this APEX2 enzyme to this region of Prisled 9 b she showed was key for specificity. This assay is designed to uh, biotinylate all proteins within 30 nanometers of this molecular tag. We then did biotin pulldowns and mass spec with David's lab. And um, the answer was became very obvious that the top 50 altered proteins that we saw here supported the involvement of the EGF receptor signaling pathway. 
Um, all of our hits were involving EGF receptor signaling or involving clathrin mediated endocytosis, which make a lot of sense, as I'll tell you in a minute. And so the EGF receptor, there are um, literally 100,000 papers on this molecule because it's involved in a wide variety of human cancers. It's very well understood. It typically, um, upon ligand binding, um, these receptors will um, heterodimerize, um, homodimerize with one another. They cross force, correlate each other, and activate signaling pathways, including RAS and PI3 and the JAK-STAT signaling pathway. And so um, the model that Stephanie put together of how this is working is that um, WIT9A binds to both frizzled 9 b and the ligand binding domain of the EGF receptor. The EGF receptor then is brought into this complex where she showed it phosphorylates this tyrosine residue on the C-terminal tail on this region that she showed was key for specificity. This entire complex is then internalized by these clathrin-mediated um, pits to endocytose these vesicles, which then interact with the so-called um, destruction complex in the cytoplasm, which then liberates beta-catenin to go to the nucleus to turn on target gene expression. And so um, this, I think Stephanie did an amazing job figuring this out. I mean, this, this there is absolutely no um, precedent in the literature for EGF receptor as being a um, co-receptor for Wnt signaling in any scenarios. And so um, this is only the second example that we know of in the literature where there is a co-receptor which can help mediate specificity of Wnt signaling in a particular context. And so she is working in her own laboratory now to try and understand if the EGF receptor is involved in other um, ligand receptor interactions or whether or not there might be other co-receptors and some of the other processes um, that she's interested in. So we next wanted to know, is this new signaling pathway important in human hematopoiesis? And so we worked with Carl to, um, uh, to um, look at this in human pluripotent stem cells. And so in differentiation protocols, where these um, human um, pluripotent stem cells can be um, induced to generate mesoderm and then vascular um, endothelium and then hematopoietic precursors, we introduced um, shRNA for frizzled 9 to block human frizzled 9, and then looked at the readout of these hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells by their combined expression of CD34 and CD45. And so as shown in this panel compared to controls here, where we just had short um, hairpin um, control RNAs, we see normal numbers of CD34, CD45, double positive cells here. When we block the function of frizzled 9, however, we see almost no generation of these HSPCs, which is quantified here on the right. And so um, we think this nicely illustrates the evolutionary conservation of this signaling pathway in the generation of early hematopoietic cells from these mesodermal precursors. And so in this fourth and final um, vignette, I'll tell you another story um, about how the somite is helping to, um, I think, more maintain hematopoietic stem cell fate. And so when Pankaj and Claire, fellows in the group, were um, imaging how these lateral plate mesodermal stripes of cells interact with the somite, um, they noticed something interesting. And so I'll show you a confocal time lapse. This is again in this time window that we're very interested in between um, 10 and 20 hours. This movie is over two hours from 14 to 16 hours. Um, what you're going to see here is that there are these stripes of lateral plate mesoderm, which are marked by this endothelial specific uh, promoter, ETB2, which marks these green cells. Um, the somites are labeled with a Semitic marker, PHLW1 in cherry. And so if you watch this time lapse, you'll see down here in this region that there is a cell which starts off red, turns yellow, and then becomes green, and essentially follows those lateral plate mesoderm cells as they dive underneath the somite to migrate to the midline. Um, there's just one cell here, so I'll show you a different movie. This is um, two hours later in another somite. Um, the same general thing is happening here. These stripes of ETV2 positive cells are migrating across the somite. The somites are marked here just with a membrane tag. And if you watch up here, you'll see a cell that comes from within the somite that starts off being orange, um, transforms into this GFP positive endothelial cell that then follows its sort of brethren as they start migrating towards the midline. And so um, 
we've done a lot of imaging experiments with these cells, and although they're rare, we think there's only about two or three of these cells generated um, from about 10 or 15 of the medial somites. And what we've seen is that they derive from this hypaxial lip of the dermomyotome, which are these cells here in blue. And this is interesting because in the chick embryo, as I'll tell you, um, there has been shown to be a very similar population of endothelial cells that are born in the somite, but then um, traffic out of the somite into the dorsal aorta. And so um, what this looks like is shown here. Here's another um, close-up image of one of these somite-derived endothelial cells that's just in the process of leaving the somite. Um, we wanted to know what these cells looked like in terms of their transcriptional profile. And so um, Pankaj showed that these cells that are ETV2 positive, which is shown here in red, um, co-express markers of early muscles. So muscle sort of precursor markers, including the transcription factor PAX3A and MIOX1 shown here. When these cells differentiate fully to muscle, as marked by MyoD, however, um, there is no co-expression. So this suggested to us that these ETV2 positive cells are deriving from these bipotent progenitors that could make either muscle or endothelium. And so this is supported by this experiment where we did um, knockdown of this muscle um, transcription factor, MIOX1. If you look relative to wild-type animals here with MIOX in green and ETV2 in red, we see that there are increases in these somite-derived endothelial cells when we knock down this key muscle gene. We can take this to an even further extreme if we also knock down MIOX1 function in the context of a NOTCH3 mutant. And so NOTCH3 is known to be the key NOTCH receptor in driving muscle commitment during somatogenesis. In this scenario, we see that um, the cell mites can transform into these wide swaths of endothelial cells as marked by um, this red ETV2 gene. And so this told us that the cell mites actually, despite only making a couple of these cell mite derived endothelial cells uh, per cell mite, have broad potential to do so if that's unmasked by looking in um, different um, genetic manipulation scenarios. So where do these cells go and what do they do? And so we took advantage of a really fantastic uh, muscle-specific driver called TBX6. This is what expression of a TBX6 GFP line looks like here. We see it just localized to the cell mites. And so we use, utilized a similar transgene. This is a TBX6 Cree which expresses the Cree recombinase only within these um, Semitic muscle precursors. Um, to this, we crossed um, this really lovely transgenic line that Jeff and Caroline Burns generated and uh, very generously shared with us, which features this endothelial uh, specific KDRL promoter driving this switch transgene. And so um, normally, without any Cree activity, the vasculature in these animals is blue, expresses CFP only. But upon Cree excision, this, um, this cassette is removed to turn um, these cells yellow. So in this scenario, only muscle-derived endothelial cells will become yellow. And so what we saw here is that um, the vast majority of the somite-derived endothelial cells incorporated into the dorsal aorta, first into the roof, because that's nearest the somite, and then later they would encapsulate much of the aortic space um, as shown here in this figure. So this is interesting because something very similar was shown in these um, chick quail um, chimeras that were generated um, when Claire was a uh, student with Thierry Jafredo's group in Paris. And so what she did here is she was able to transplant um, pre-Semitic mesoderm from the quail into the chick embryo, and then using antibodies specific to quail could show later um, that there are um, quail-derived cells um, surrounding um, the dorsal aorta, which is seen here in this close-up image. So this was interesting to us because evolutionarily, this looked very similar to what we have seen in the zebrafish. And so can these cells generate blood? I told you they are born in the somite, they migrate to the aorta. Um, can they be hemogenic? Um, the answer to that is no. We generated a very similar lineage trace where we um, use this TBX6 muscle specific driver um, to um, activate Cree and recombine another switch line that goes from blue to red. 
And so when we do this, we see that we in fact get conversion of the somitic um, tissue into red. We also see the somite derived endothelial cells um, forming um, within the dorsal aorta shown here and here. And then when we grew these animals up, we waited six months and we looked at adult animals in the kidney, which is where the, the hematopoietic cells are. Um, we saw that there were effectively no hematopoietic stem cells. There were no red cells in the kidneys of any of these lineage trace animals, which told us that these cells, although they go to the dorsal aorta and to the aortic floor, do not have hematopoietic potential. And so what are they doing then? And so we did single cell RNA sequencing of the somite-derived endothelial cells on the right and compared them to um, the posterior lateral mesoderm-derived endothelial cells on the left and noticed that these SDECs expressed high levels of these factors that we and others have shown to be um, key um, support elements for early hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, including angiopoietin like 4, BMP4, um, the spark protein. And so we thought from this pattern that perhaps these cells are migrating to the dorsal aorta to provide um, necessary signals for a sort of the continued maturation and eventual emergence of HSCs. And so to get at that, we did some um, genetic manipulation experiments designed to push this bipotent precursor either towards endothelial fates or towards muscle. And so the first experiment we did was we looked at RUNX1 expression, which marks early um, hemogenic endothelium. And um, we introduced a transgene in which the um, endothelial specific um, um, transcription factor, ETV2, was expressed by this early muscle driver. Um, when we do this, when we push these bipotent precursors to make more endothelium, we see an increase in RUNX1 positive HSCs relative to um, litter mate controls. We, um, did a very similar experiment. We used a MIOX1 morpholino to increase the number of somite derived endothelial cells at the expense of muscle and see the same increase in HSC precursors. And conversely, when we injected a MIOX1 mRNA to push those bipotent precursors to just make muscle, we see a um, near complete absence of hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells as um, evidenced by their lack of expression of GATA 2B. And so um, we think that this means that these cells, um, although they don't generate blood, are becoming key niche elements that help the maturation of these cells over time. And so we're working now to understand which of these um, factors that they either express on their membrane or secrete are key to the phenotypes we've observed here. And so um, I've told you now four different vignettes for um, these roles of the somite in the instruction or maintenance of hematopoietic stem cell fate. Um, there's this early proliferation cue we've, we've discovered that's emanating from the cell mite that's needed by the precursors of HSCs. And so no matter what we've started studying over the past several years, it's led us back to the importance of the cell mite in the instruction of HSC fate, which has come as a, um, a big surprise to us. And so what we're working on now, as um, Katrina mentioned, and I showed you with um, the WENT9 experiments, is that we're working to translate our discoveries in the zebrafish to human pluripotent stem cells. I told you that we cannot yet generate bona fide HSCs um, from these sorts of approaches. Our hope is that if we provide these factors we've uncovered, such as um, notch signaling, which I didn't tell you about today, but uh, much of our work in the last several years has suggested notch as a really key signaling um, molecule for this process. TNF and interferon gamma are also key. Um, I've told you about the role for WET9A. We're hoping that if we provide all of these factors in the right temporal order, we can um, increase the efficiency of hemogenic endothelium generation from these human pluripotent stem cells such that we may be eventually able to generate transplantable hematopoietic stem cells. All right, and so um, I think I thanked people along the way for these experiments. Um, the people in the lab that were really the drivers of all these projects are shown here on the left. Um, we are indebted to David Gonzalez for helping us identify the EGF receptor as a co-receptor for WENT9A. All of our WENT studies were done in very close collaboration with our longtime um, colleague, Carl Willard. I'd like to thank our funding sources for making all this work possible and uh, thank all of you for your attention.
Okay, great, David. Um, really beautiful work as, as always. Um, looking for anybody who has um, questions, gonna enter them in the Q and A. We got time for uh, a couple. Um, I'll ask. Well, well, maybe we're we're waiting, and and you know, as you mentioned, I mean, our our interest has been, um, you know, with you to to see if we can get true transplantable HSCs, and so you know, one of these is as you mentioned these these waves of development, and and you have sort of lined up these factors. The the other element, is, you have it all. I'll say on an aggressive developmental timeline, right? So yes. within a couple of weeks. So what is the time when, you know, I'll say the in the human embryo or fetus that the cells actually start to emerge from the AGM? And, you know, is that something we also have to recapitulate in these cultures? Yeah, good question. I think that's right. I mean, you're right in that, you know, zebrafish development is incredibly fast, right? So these stem cell emergence events take place between about 36 hours and 72 hours of development. You know, in this human pluripotent stem cell system, that takes several weeks, right? So mm -hmm. the time order is very different. It's also very different in um, human hematopoiesis. Um, I was just at a meeting where Hanna Mikola has made a huge amount of progress there trying to um, look at human development, um, at exactly when and where these events happen. And I think, you know, um, in terms of temporal order, the findings are very well conserved between human, between mouse, and between fish in terms of what happens first and the pathways that are activated. So our hopes um, are that findings in any one of these systems can be put into the human ESL systems, right? And still um, still be relevant to the way human hematopoietic cells develop. Okay. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, as I was suggesting, it. it Maybe you know whether it's I don't know you have a twenty eight day time frame there, but it you know it may just be longer is something that I've started to to feel that we we get these primitive waves you know quite readily, but it it as you say the challenge is getting the definitive. Yeah, um, I think, you know, like like Gordon Keller has shown, if you block specific pathways during those windows, you know you can um, block emergence of primitive blood. You know, mm -hmm. You keep those processes in check. You can keep pushing the cells with these factors to go down the definitive pathways, which will, mm -hmm. you know, lead us to um, generate HSEs or something very close to that. Okay. All right. One more question, I think, before we get to Gene. I was wondering if it's possible to differentiate iPSCs to heme endothelium, and the later can be used as a co-culture model for iPS HSC differentiation. Um, so I guess develop two populations, essentially. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's sort of getting at one idea. You know, one of the things we're, we, one of the models we like is, you know, we think there's a population of arterial endothelium that does not ever um, convert to blood, right? So if we identify some of the key factors that you need to make hemogenic endothelium, um, we think we may be able to convert those non-hemogenic fates into hemogenic potential if you put the right things into those cells, right? Or maybe even with these somite-derived endothelial cells, if we can um, convert those to becoming hemogenic, that would also be really impressive since our um, work to date has shown that those cells have zero hematopoietic potential, right? So it serves as a really nice assay for maybe pushing those cells in that direction. Okay. Yeah, no, lots of, lots of great work.